Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today, we're going to hear more presentations uh, in relation to those who died in the fire. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman, good morning to you. Good morning, members of the panel. We're grateful for the short delay in the start to the proceedings this morning. May I invite, please, Mr. Mr. Danny Freeman, QC, to come back to the podium to make the presentation on behalf of the Chukare family, that is, Syria Chukare from, from Flat 191, Bassem Chukare from Flat 193, Nadia Chukare, Mirna Chukare, Fatima Chukare, and Zainab Chukare, all also from Flat 193. May I also repeat the trigger warning that I've given in most of the other presentations, which is to say that many of those here today and watching on the live stream may find what they are about to hear distressing. And if they do, then they are free to leave the room or to look away from the live stream appropriately. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Friedman. When you have lost six family members, spanning three generations, as the Shukair family have, the pain is unfathomable. It is impossible to conceive. May I open with the family's words. Memories, 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 this is all we have. Cherishable memories, lovable memories, laughable memories, enjoyable memories, we could go on and on. They will always be in our heart and soul. They will never be forgotten. Nadir Shukair, Basim Shukair, and their three daughters, Mirna, Fatima, and Zainab, lived in flat 193 on what became floor 22 after the refurbishment. Nadia's mother, Syria Shukair, moved into flat 191 on the floor in 2013. All six members of this family died in the fire. They are survived and deeply mourned by Syria's three surviving children, Nabil, Sosan, and Hissam, Bassam's sister, Malak, Bassam's parents, Badr and Tan, and Syria's mother, Hayat, and Syria's younger brother, Jamil. However, the loss is also suffered by a large extended family, including many young nieces, nephews, and cousins, all of whom were deeply connected with the lives of those who died. Can I start with the formal details relating to each individual? Syria Shukair, was born on the 25th of October, 1956. She was 60 years old at the time of her death. Her place of birth was Nal village in the Baalbek district of Lebanon. Syria worked all her life in the catering is industry at the Royal Marsden Hospital. She was the sole tenant at flat 191 Grenfell Tower. Her daughter, Sorsan, lived with her. Nadia Shukair was Syria's daughter and the wife of Bassam Shukair. She was born in London on the 14th of January, 1983. She was 34 years old when she died. She was a nursery school teacher assistant at the local Avondale Park Primary School on Serdo Road. Many children in the local area knew Nadia just as they knew her children, who I now turn to. Mirna Shukair, I apologise, before I turn to her children, may I deal with Bassam Shukair. Bassam Shukair was born on the 1st of December 1976. He was 40 years old when he died. He too came from Nal village in Lebanon. Bassam worked as a supermarket section coordinator at Marks and Spencer's on Earls Court Road. He and his family lived at flat 
193 Grenfell Tower. Maya then turned to the children. Mina Shuker was born on the 22nd of November, 2003. She was 13 years old. She was a secondary school pupil at Kensington Aldridge Academy. Fatima Shuker was born on the 1st of March, 2006. She was 11 years old. She was a primary school pupil at Avondale Park Primary, where her mother worked. Zainab Shuker was the third of the three daughters. Born on the 17th of May, 2014, she was three years old. She had started at the nursing school at Avondale Park. Sir, you will recall commemorations on the 22nd of May, 2018, and on the 30th of May, 2018, presented by Syria's surviving children, during which a letter written by Bassam's parents was also read out. Those commemorations contained powerful video presentations. You heard from all quarters about what an extraordinary, close-knit, joyful and loving family Nadia and Bassam had. On the floor 22, the family were always knocking on each other's doors and in each other's homes. You also heard of the family's close ties to their community, in the tower, in Avondale School, where Nadia worked, Zainab had just started, and the other girls had attended. Mirna was at the academy, and Fatima was about to start there in September. Syria had worked at the Royal Marsden Hospital under the supervision of Pili Burton from Flat 165, who you heard was devoted, uh, that his Syria was devoted to. When Hissam and Nabil drove around so many hospitals on the 14th of June, they would find understanding and sympathy in the Royal Marsden, which his son recognised because Pili and his mum spoke so highly of it. Turning to each of the deceased. Syria Shuker, as you heard, was born in 1956 in Lebanon and helped bring up her young siblings. In the early 1970s, Syria emigrated to the UK and married Ghassan Shuker, who sadly passed away in 2002. They made a home in South Kensington, in the rural borough of Kensington and Chelsea, where they raised their four children. No one, you were told, worked harder than Syria to care for and support their family. She was a loving, caring mother who prioritised preparing her children for life's challenges, working hard to give them the opportunities she did not have, including the best possible education. Syria was remembered as a proud, resilient and devout woman who was patient and gentle and always thought of others before herself. She instilled in her children the importance of respect for oneself and others. Her delicious Lebanese cooking would give even, good, give, give even a top chef a good run for his money. Syria took great pleasure in all her children and grandchildren and loved to spoil them rotten with gifts treats and fun days out as a family. Nadia Shuker was remembered by her older siblings as their cute and adorable baby sister, who they all squabbled over bathing, feeding and cuddling. One of her nicknames was Munchkin. Nadia had a heart of gold with the work ethic and resilience of her father and mother. Her cheeky smile brightened up the people around her. Nadia's passion was to work in childcare. She started at the very beginning by going to college and then working at Avondale Nursery, where she was much valued by parents, colleagues, and children alike. Nadia also spoke her mind. She was a fighter. She would always stand up for her rights and always knew the difference between right and wrong. And so it was that she expressed her opposition to features of the refurbishment works that have been the subject of inquiry in module three. Since the fire happened, the family has been amazed how many strangers have come up to say that they were connected to Nadia and how much they loved her. She touched many lives. There is now a memorial to her at the school. She was sociable and had a lot of close friends. Basim Shuker came from the Nal village in the Baalbek district of Lebanon. Basim and Nadia met and married in Lebanon. Their love for each other 
was so profound that family and friends called them Romeo and Juliet. Together, they raised three beautiful children, Mirna, Fatima, and Zainab, who all tragically perished in the fire. Bassam was an incredibly hard-working and conscientious person. He would do anything to put food on the table of his family. He worked his way up in Marks and Spencers from sales assistant to section coordinator. He was professional and rigorous at work to the extent that staff were in awe of and respected him. But at home, he was very different, showing his gentle and caring side. Bussum would wake up as early as 4 a.m. and would always cycle to work because it saved money and kept him healthy. He tried to persuade Sorshan Shuker, his sister-in-law, to cycle with him as they worked together, but Sorshan would prefer to take the bus. Despite his discipline at work, Bassam still made the job fun with a joke up his sleeve and his desire to make people happy and smile. Panel, you get a certain measure of this man in that during the early stages of the fire at 0155, he texted colleagues at work to let them know he would not be there the following day, but wanted to support them early to make backup arrangements. He told them, sorry guys for letting you down. Even when Sawson called Bassam on the night, he first thought, his first thought was to reassure her that everything was all right, even though he was trapped in a burning building. Turning now to the children. You heard during commemorations how close Mirna, Fatima, and Zainab were to one another, and to Hissam and Nabil's children, and how they loved their aunties, uncles, and grandmother. Mirna Shuker was Nadia and Bassam's eldest daughter. She was a student at Kensington Oldridge Academy where she had many friends. She was bright and confident and loved learning. She wanted to study law and be a lawyer. Like her mum, she loved swimming. At the time, aged 13, she was like a sunflower opening, excelling in all areas of her life. She was a talented artist. She also brought a smile to people's faces. She was a naturally resilient person who was also protective over her younger sisters. You will hear about her courage and intelligence during the fire. She, like her sister Fatima, loved clothes and would often go shopping with Sorsan. Sorsan would sometimes come home to find Mina and a friend had been trying on all her clothes and shoes. She had an excellent sense of humour. And, and, came, and that came through clearly from the entertaining video sketches shown at the commemoration hearing, which so poignantly captured also the everyday life in her home at Grenfell. Fatima Shuker was the middle child of the family. At 11 years old, she was completing year six at Avondale Park Primary School and about to go to secondary school. Fatima's passion was to be a gymnast. She was a loving, caring and gentle girl with her future ahead of her to do what she dreamed. She loved music and was very popular with a lot of friends. You heard from her teacher that Fatima was held in high esteem at the school as a delightful, charming little girl. Like her elder sister, Fatima was a bright and conscientious student, and like her parents, deeply respectful of others. She was also extremely active and loved sport. She played in the school football team with three of her best friends. Finally, Zainab Shuker, also known as Zuzu, aged just three at the time of the fire. Her birth completed the family. Relatives and friends alike instantly fell in love with her. They describe her as adorable, the spark of the family, a showstopper who would steal the limelight no matter the occasion. Zainab had the same type of cheeky smile as her mother. It would light up the room. You heard of Zainab's sense of humour. She would sneak in and interrupt her cousin's games and conversations. She loved to recite her favourite nursery rhymes with a great deal of flair. Syria Shuker 
would care for Zainab during the day so that Nadia could work. This was a bond that Zainab could enjoy in her all too young life. My I deal with further background matters relevant to the night of the fire? First, the tenancy swap that brought Syria and Sawson to live at Grenfell. Syria Shukair came to move to flat 193 by virtue of a three-way mutual tenancy exchange. Syria moved from the original three-bedroom flat elsewhere in the borough. Syria and Sawsan moved to flat 191 Grenfell Tower. Helen Gebremesco moved to flat 186, and the prior tenant of flat 186 moved to Syria's previous home. Syria and Sawson moved from their much larger flat to be in the one bedroom flat 191 because they wanted to be closer to Bassam and Nadia and in the context of Syria's significant physical health conditions and care needs. The whole family assisted Syria in different ways to allow her to lead a normal life. Sir, at the commemoration, you heard how Syria's health deteriorated after her husband's death. She's developed severe arthritis, including osteoarthritis of the knees, and also suffered from chronic pain, including back pain, which would radiate to her legs, high blood pressure, vertigo, and low vitamin D levels for which she received medical treatment. Her ill health brought her work in catering to an end and eventually meant she had to walk with a stick. Her mobility problems were such that once she moved to flat 91 on floor 22, she was unable to leave the home when the Grenfell lifts were out of order. On this point, may I add that the anthropology evidence in respect of Syria shoe care found evidence of osteophyte formation indicative of degenerative disease. Syria's physical health problems were known to her previous landlord, Family Mosaic and Peabody Direct, at the time of the exchange. Indeed, by virtue of her use of a walking stick, her mobility problems were clear to all those she interacted with. The significance of Syria's mobility issue for, the fire, for fire safety was not considered within the tenancy exchange application process or during the period of her tenancy at Grenfell. As of the date of the fire, and as you know, with all other residents with relevant disabilities, there were no arrangements in place to assist Assyria to evacuate the building via the single staircase in the event of a need to do so, nor were there any pre-existing communications or arrangements with the LFB to secure her assisted evacuation or rescue. It bears noting that in addition to Syria's vulnerability, Nadia, Fatima and Zainab are all understood to have suffered from asthma, reference to which was made during Nadia's 999 call at 2.37 a.m., which I will come to shortly. My turn to the time of the fire. Now, Bill Shukair visited Bassam and Nadia on the night of the 12th of June and stayed with them until the following morning. The children of Hissam and Kona Shukair stayed overnight with their grandmother, Syria, and were taken to school by their uncle, Nabil, on the morning of the 13th of June. CCTV, CCTV images show the last sightings of the family returning to their home on the 13th of June in the afternoon dealing with them in turn. Bassam Shukair can be seen with his bike in the lift lobby of Grenfell Tower waiting to go up into the building at 15.02. Mirna Shukair was in the lift lobby of Grenfell Tower waiting to go up at 15.34. She was coming home from school. Syria Shukair with Fatima and Zainab can be seen in the lift lobby of the tower at 15.38 the grandmother had picked up the younger children from school. And Nadia Shukair arrived back from work and was in the lift lobby of the tower waiting to go up 
at 1613. After that time, his Sam Shuker picked his children up from his mother's flat and he briefly saw Syria, Nadia, Bassam and their three children a final time before returning home. The phase one analysis of the footage of the external fire spread on the flat six column of the tower confirms that the fire reached floor 22 before 0126. Some of these matters were introduced last week, but I am now going to give more detail in relation to this floor. Naomi Lee from flat 195 began to smell smoke in her flat as early as 0115 to 0117 and called her husband, Lee Chapman, who was in Malaysia at 0120 to tell him about the smoke. She then called the LFB control room for the first time at 0121 to tell them that she could smell smoke. She was told that the fire was on floor four and that they should stay in their premises. Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe, Naomi's cousin, then saw Mariam and Ezla Elguari on their landing, who told them that there was a fire in their kitchen in flat 196. Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe would shortly after shelter in Nassim and Basa, Nadia and Bassam's home. Mariam Elguari, as you know, made a call to the control room at 0130, once inside flat 205 on floor 23. She told the operator that her kitchen was on fire in flat 196 and that there was smoke in flat 205 where she had now taken shelter. According to Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe, it was difficult to evacuate from floor 22 at the time due to the number of people coming up the stairs. I addressed you in detail on the various factors behind this upwards migration in the presentation for Debbie Lamprell on the 6th of July 2022. Can we look at the additional events on this particular floor? Before 0130, the daughter of Hurstway Walk resident <laughs> Nadia El Bouti called Mina Shuker, her best friend, to tell her there was a fire. Mina's immediate response was that she needed to go next door to help her grandmother, who she mentioned relied on a walking stick. At around this time, Nadia Shuker invited Naomi and Lydia into flat 193, where they saw the children and the, quote, nanny from flat 191. That would have been Syria. Between 0130 and 0150, Control room operators took calls from occupants on floor 22, informing them that the fire had adversely affected the floor. At 01.30.08, Anthony Disson from flat 194 called the control room to say that it was terrible on his floor and that he could not see his hand in front of him. He was assured, we're on our way, to which Anthony Disson replied, I'll tell all the rest. At 01.30.38, Naomi Lee again called the control room. She indicated that she was in her neighbour's home and informed CRO Gotts that there's all smoke now. She said that her neighbour had told her that the fire was in the kitchen on floor 22. The control room did not establish which flat the caller was now in, how many people were with her, or the fact that the fire was in the kitchen of flat 196. At 01.34.50, Hashim Kadir from flat 192 called the control room to tell them that they were in that flat and said that they, quote, couldn't get down the stairs because the stairs is full of smoke. Naomi Shuker. Naomi Shuker made her first call to the emergency services at 1.40.46. She got through to BT pre-exchange and responded that there was a fire at Grenfell Tower and gave her location, the 22nd floor, her flat number, flat 193, and requested the attendance of the fire brigade. This was a point in time 
when the emergency call system was overloading. The phase one report established at volume two, paragraph 12.69, that between 0140 and 0150, the LFB control room received 21 emergency calls from residents trapped in the building and from members of the public. Nadia was therefore placed in a holding queue, waiting to be connected to a control room, a queue which she remained in for over seven minutes. She was informed by BT that the London fire services were aware of the fire and was told to hold the line while she was connected to the fire services. Children's voices and Arabic, possibly Syria shoe care speaking, can be heard in the background during the call. Nadia was finally diverted to Essex Fire and Rescue Service at 0148. Immediately upon connection, Nadia said, please help us. The implication was that she was not alone, but she was not asked about that. Neither was she asked about the profile of the people in the flat. Nadia repeated that she was in flat 193 on the 22nd floor, that it was getting very smoky inside the house and said, it's getting a lot on the 22nd floor. By it, she must have meant the fire. Having waited a considerable period to be put through, Nadia was informed, we'll go back through London for you. For reasons I will return to, this did not happen. Anthony Disson was put through to the LFB control room at 0150 to tell them that smoke was coming into flat 194 and that he could not see anything. He was told, we're going to come up, we've got firefighters coming to the 22nd floor already. In none of these calls panel, between 0130 to 0150, were the occupants of floor 22 advised to evacuate, and in none of the calls were details taken to establish the profile of residents to establish whether evacuation was possible. At 0148, immediately after the call to the Essex control room, or perhaps during it, Nadia Shuker sent a text message to her friend Helen Gebremesco, which confirmed her understanding to, quote, stay in. Following that 01348 call from Nadia, Essex Control Room made efforts to try and contact the LFB directly and via group manager Dilly, the National Information Liaison Officer, or NILO, as the role was known. They could not get through on a direct line until 0218. When CRO Marshall spoke to CRO Adams in the LFB at 021815, she said that the flat number of the caller on the 22nd floor had not been provided. As the phase one report found at volume two, paragraph 14.269, that was in fact incorrect, as Nadia had supplied the flat number during the 0148 call. At 0226, the NILO gained contact with the Metropolitan Police and asked if someone could pass the message on to the LFB that Essex had received a call from residents in flat 193 on floor 22. The phase one report found at volume two, paragraph 14.270, that, quote, it is unclear whether the messages relayed to the control room by Essex FRS were passed onto the incident ground, and if so, how? There is no record that the messages were passed on at that time, although it is possible that SMO Olif did so. The inquiry does, however, have clear evidence that service requests were made and passed to the fire ground following the earlier calls from other residents on floor 22. They were as follows. A control room request referred to, quote, persons on 22nd floor smoke coming into flat. It was created at 01.32.29, was in process on the log at 01.35.36, but only recorded as completed at 01.41.35. 
There were radio messages to various LFB pumps between 0135 and 0136 that stated, quote, we've got persons on, twen on the 22nd floor with smoke coming into their flat. The phase one report found at volume two at paragraph 11.155 that these messages were probably, would probably not have been passed on to the command unit until after 0143. The earliest known list of FSG's calls at the incident ground, known as the Sadler's List, was drawn up at approximately between 0140 and 0150. It referred, for these purposes, to flat 195 floor 22. In other words, the only call registered at the incident ground at that time was the 121 call, but that was made by Naomi, but by this time, we know from the 0138 call, she had already moved to her neighbor's flat. At 0209, the control room called through to command unit eight to indicate, quote, we've got a caller in flat 192 on the 22nd floor unable to leave. And that appears to link to the call between Hashim Kadir and CRR Duddy at 0134. And we re can return to some of these matters on the Kadir family presentation that will follow this one. So, um, may I ask for a 10 minute break? And um, if we need more time, we'll ask for. Yes, of course. Thank no, you. I, uh, we understand. That's, that's, uh, a, that's an appropriate moment. Of course, uh, we'll rise. Well, is 10 minutes going to be long enough? We would normally have a longer break in the morning, but. May I ask for 15? Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank we'll you very much. We'll rise for 15 minutes then. Thank you. 11.15. Thank you.
Yes, Mr Friedman. Thank you for the break, panel. I'm also going to speak a little slower so that the interpreters can keep up with me. Right. Before we adjourned, I'd summarised the service requests from control rooms to the fire ground relating to floor 22 that were made between 0141 through to 0209. No deployments were specifically made to the floor for the purposes of rescue until after 0303, at which time watch manager De Silva deployed firefighters Cod and Joseph. By way of a trigger warning, in a moment I'm going to ask for an image of a list of flats to be brought up. This is a handwritten list on the wall of floor three. It was created while the bridgehead was still there. It will show flat numbers and references to how many persons were understood to be there. It does not contain any other images of, of fire and the like. But if anyone does not want to see it, may they please look away now. On that basis, may I call up MET 3015819. I'm going to address you about the numbers towards the top. Two points. First, this single deployment reflected on the wall of floor three is 22195, and then it says to its left hand side, Cod and Johnny. And that is the only dedicated deployment to the floor. And it was, as we said before the break, outdated as Naomi Lee relayed to the control room at 013038 that they had moved to the neighbor's house now. <coughs> this reference is derived from the Sadler's List, which was by then nearly one and a half hours old. Can we just keep it up? And I'll make our second point is that unlike other flats or floors that you can see there, there is no circle or tick around 22193. The absence of a circle may indicate there was no further information about the floor or flat that was passed to the bridgehead before it moved down to the ground floor at approximately 0315. Take the image down, please. I'm going to return to the Cod Joseph deployment, but for now, please bear in mind that neither firefighter tragically reached the 22nd floor. This was a missed opportunity for those on that floor. Firefighter Cod would, however, meet Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe coming down from the floor. There were no further deployments to floor 22 after this time. It bears adding, and as you have heard, at 0156, the Paddington crew were deployed to the top floor for the purposes of firefighting, not search and rescue. At some point between floors 20 and 21, they discovered Faduma Ahmed and brought her down. Firefighter Roberts, who traveled the furthest up the building than any other firefighter that night, as far as we understand the evidence, reached floor 22, where he says he, quote, opened the door to the floor, stuck his head in, shouted out, but received no response from anybody, so he went back down. There is no evidence that his presence registered with any of the multiple remaining occupants on floor 22. Professor Purser's evidence has highlighted the tragic potential for residents to escape via the stairs, including the top floor, throughout the night. However, for a resident with significant mobility issues such as serious issue care, unassisted evacuation was not a realistic option. Walking down 22 stair floors, even with a family member's assistance, would have been very difficult for Syria even in normal times. 
Moreover, once the conditions in the staircase deteriorated, there was no realistic prospect of walking down within a timescale that would have averted collapse due to exposure to smoke, to acid, and to asphyxiant gases. It is a fact that residents with such mobility, mobility impairments and family or friends who were not prepared to leave them were trapped. On this, we draw attention to the status of the Grenfell lifts, which phase one established at volume four, paragraph 3411, were not firefighting lifts, and even in the early stages of the fire, could not be brought under control by the LFB in order that they could be used for the purposes of search and rescue. The inquiry will in due course determine submissions made in other modules about the course of that situation. Members of the panel, I'm now going to turn to deal with the further calls, the family's attempt to escape, and the Kadir family entering flat 193 from flat 192. To get our bearings, can we please have the MPS floor pan on the, of the 22nd floor? And we've seen this similar diagram before. May I give a trigger warning about it? Again, it's a floor plan that will show names of those who died, but no other images. Can I ask for MET 0001229 and page 24? Looking at that plan, can I just deal with what's gone on across the floor? The El Guaris have moved upstairs to the 23rd floor from flat 196. You see the six flat. Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe have moved from flat 195 to flat 193 to the home of Nadia and Basim. The Kadir family with their three children were still at this time in flat 192. Tony Disson remained in flat 194. Syria Shuker had moved from flat 191 into flat 193 to be with the rest of her family, possibly brought there by her granddaughter Mirna. We can take down the diagram. As you will hear in later presentations, multiple calls were made from floor 22 in the second hour of the fire. Please bear in mind those calls when you consider the situation of the Shukare family. For present purposes, may I focus particularly on the calls from flat 193. We know that from 0236, the Shukare family recommenced making emergency calls. At 02.36.39, Nadia Shuker connected to BT Exchange. She said that we need to know what's going on. Although not reflected on the transcript, a voice can be heard on the recording saying that there's a fire next door. Upon being transferred to the LFB control room at 02.37, Nadia Shuker told them that they were in flat 193 on the 22nd floor and that there were eight people in the room. She explained that there was a buildup of smoke in their flat coming from a fire next door, although she had blocked the doors and shut the windows as advised. She repeated throughout the call with increasing anxiety that there was too much smoke in the room. The transcript records Nadia saying that she had very bad asthma, though listening to the recording, it may be that she said that a child had very bad asthma, which could have been a reference to Fatima or Zainab Shuker. In this call, Nadia asked, can the helicopter take us, please? Rescue by helicopters was something that would be raised by various occupants of the flat in subsequent calls. CRO Adams made no response to that request. She told her, we're trying to get to you as soon as possible, and we are coming to you we will get to you, okay? In the background, a male voice, believed to be Basim Shuker, could also be heard to ask if there was a helicopter. Nadia was told to ring back if it starts catching fire in your house. The call was ended by the LFB. On the tape, the caller remained on the line and was heard to say, if you send us the helicopter, we can get out of the window. 
That's the phase one report found at volume four, paragraph 29, 94 and 99, the stay put advice had been revoked in the control room at around 0235, although there would have been a period of time during which this was relayed to indiv two individual CROs. The Shukare family were not given that advice to get out at this time. At 02.42.11, a male caller understood from, the audio uh, understood from the audio during Nadia's 02.37 call to be Bassam Shukare, called 999 again. Upon connecting with BT Exchange, Bassam can be heard on the recording to say, we are burning in the house. Fire brigade, quickly please. We are dying, guys. We can't sit in the house from the smoke. Bassam was then put through to CRO Adams at 024355. He told her that the fire was about to come into flat 193, where there were seven or eight people. He asked, if you send helicopter from the other side, you can get out other side, but was informed, we don't have any helicopters, I'm sorry. The operator then told the family for the first time, that they needed to get themselves out now. Bassam replied, we can't get out of the building. There is smoke everywhere. The operator said that Bassam had to leave, but ended by saying, you make the decision whether you think you need to leave or not. The phase one report found at volume four, paragraph 2999, that this was not the clear and uncompromising advice that SOM Smith had instructed operators to give. According to Naomi Lee, the Shukare family tried to leave the flat at this juncture. Nadia Shukare was desperate for the two neighbors not to be left behind and grabbed Naomi's cardigan, tearing it. However, Naomi would not leave without speaking to the fire service first, having previously been told to stay put. Naomi Lee then called the control room at 025109, she said, we want to know if we, need to, if we need to run downstairs or where to go. Despite the stay put advice having been revoked in the control room and at the fire ground, she was told that there was smoke everywhere in the building and to quote, make your way out or stay where you are. I can't see, you need to decide that for yourself your best bet is to try to get out of there. <coughs> During the course of the call, there was knocking on the door. In her inquiry statement, Naomi confirms that this was the Shukare family returning back. The timing of the Shukare family returning to flat 193 can also be placed by reference to a subsequent call that started with BT Exchange at 025539 in which Nadia Shukare can be heard to shout, help, help, we're alive in Grenfell Tower. Upon being put through to CRO Duddy, Nadia handed the phone to Lydia Lowe who asked, quote, can you send a helicopter because the fire is everywhere? She added, the fire is just next to us, in the room next to us. The operator advised them several times with an emphatic voice to leave, ending by saying this was their only chance of surviving. Can I turn to additional contact with family and friends? Mina Shukare sent her best friend a WhatsApp message at 0240 saying that they needed to try to escape. It was in reply to a screenshot sent by the friend showing the tower on fire from the outside. Nadia Shukare left her brother Nubil Shukare a voice message in Arabic at 0241, which translates as, Hello Nabil, there is a fire in our building. We are sitting in our flat. Okay, bye. Between 0240 and just after 03 o'clock, Sorsan Shukare was in touch with her sister, culminating in her standing with a firefighter at the scene and telling Nadia to get out, get to the stairs. As recorded in the phase one report 
at volume three, paragraph 16.12, a photograph taken of the whiteboard in command unit seven at the incident ground, time stamped at 03 o'clock, reflected the state of knowledge based on survivor survivor calls at that time. I would like the picture of this whiteboard to be shown to the panel so that you can recall how the information was set up. But before that, a trigger warning, please. It is an image of a whiteboard that will again show flats and numbers, but no other images. Its reference is MET 00015636. I'm looking at the top of the whiteboard where you can see flat 192 and then two, referring we think from the evidence to adults and then five, referring to children with a P, suggesting priority. Now that would reflect the Kadir family, but in fact, there were two adults and three children. Flat 193, it says two <coughs> for adults, three for children with a P, priority. That is also not correct. There were five adults. Flat 194, one adult with a P for priority. That's Mr. Disson. And flat 195, six adults. That is also not correct. The information as of 3 a.m. was out of date. It did not reflect what Naomi Lee relayed in the caller 013038 when she said, we are in the neighbor's house now or what was said in the calls made from flat 193 at 0237 by Nadia <coughs> Shukair and 0242 by Bassam Shukair, in which the presence of eight people was relayed, i.e. their family and Naomi and Lydia. We can take down the image, thank you. When I told you before about the COD and Joseph deployment, I showed you the wall on floor three. That was where the bridge head was just before it moved, before 0315. And the only information written on the third floor, you will recall, was 22195, with no other references to priority status or the occupants or any other mention of flat 192, 193 or 194, as identified in the whiteboard, time stamped at three o'clock that we just saw. Can we then turn to the list of FSG information that was written onto the wall of the ground floor of the tower once the bridgehead had moved down there? And this was written by watch manager Williams. My final trigger warning, this will be writing in relation to flat numbers and persons. The reference is MET 00158 one five. I'm going to ask to zoom in on the bottom end of the middle column of handwriting and you will see a reference to 193 flat 193 and 22 floor 22 so 193 22 and it says 10 P it's if it's difficult to see, it's four up from the bottom in the middle column. 193, 22, 10p. Now that entry must have been written after three o'clock and indeed likely after 321, as it cannot be seen on the earlier photographs. And I'm going to link it to what happened with Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe. But while you're still looking at it, the fact that there is no BA i.e. breathing apparatus written next to it, indicates that no crews were sent to the flat after that time. Other parts of that wall do bear the BA reference. We can take it down, thank you. I'm not going to ask for it to be shown, but you, sir, and the panel will recall there was also a green wall 
at the bottom of the stairs at Grenfell Tower that was also used to write down information. And there is no reference to uh, flat 193 or anything to do with persons there on that wall. The reference, just for the record, is MET 00015817. Finally, a personal notebook entry was made by watch manager Fernell that read 193, 22nd floor, 11 people, which he suspected came from the command unit at some point before 0347. The phase one report concluded at volume three, paragraph 16.55, that it was likely that the Hashim Qadir family relocated from flat 192 to flat 193 shortly before three o'clock and that they were certainly there by 0307. At 02.59.29, police helicopter footage captures a person at the southwest corner living room of flat 193 waving their hand and the information was communicated to the police operators as quote people on the balcony southwest corner second floor from the top footage which i'll come back to over the next few minutes shows two people leaning out of the window and smoke coming out of the flat the reference for that video is met three zeros two one five one six and the police log is met three zeros two three two nine four page 19. Bassam Shuker called BT exchange at 0301 47. He said please we are dying guys we're dying. At the same time Footage from the MPAS helicopter shows someone at the window of flat 193 who is believed by members of the family to have been Bushem. He, gest uh, je je gest he gesticulates as if to attract the attention of the helicopter crew, but there was no hope of rescue. Bussum was put through to the LFB at 030206. He asked CRO Housen to send a helicopter. The, helicopter re the, the operator replied, we can't rescue you with a helicopter, and that they would have to leave. As she put it, and I quote, make your way to the stairwell. It's going to be dark. You can make your way along the wall, open the door very slowly, seeing what's going out, and make your way to the stairwell, and walk down the stairs out of the building. But make sure you're all covered Get yourself wet blankets, towels. You will need to leave the building. Bassam Shuker called BT Exchange again at 030434, telling them that they were dying and asking for a helicopter. He was put through to CRO Duddy, who told him to cover himself and the rest of the family up with wet towels and go to the staircase, and that was their only option. He told Bassam, I know the smoke and I know it's gonna be hard, but this is your only chance, your only chance. Naomi Lee called the LFB at 030713. She told them that there were 12 people now in the flat. In fact, there were 13 people, including her. And that the smoke was really bad now. She was told to cover with wet blankets and make their way down. Prior to the call, Naomi had spoken to Lee Chapman. As with the Italian families yesterday, this is another example of Lee, the husband, watching the fire on television and talking to Naomi on the phone about the fire while he's in Malaysia and she is in Grenfell Tower. The couple discussed uh, how Naomi and Lydia would try to leave and make it down for their last chance. Can I deal with the timing of Naomi and Lydia's evacuation from the flat? As we know, at 0303, firefighter Cod tallied out from entry control. He and firefighter Joseph were briefed to go to flat 195 on floor 22. The crew was not briefed with the details of the occupants of that flat. 
In his phase one evidence, Mr. Codd told the inquiry that he had no radio communications once he started going up the tower. On the way up, he met a group of what he perceived to be three children. The group must have included Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe, who were adults. On meeting the crew, Naomi Lee recalls telling the firefighter that she had left more than 10 people in flat 193 on floor 22. Although fire, fire cod, firefighter Cod neither recalled this nor sought to ascertain where the evacuees had come from, the information appears to have been written on the ground floor wall. I showed you before the middle column, flat 193, floor 22, 10p. The evacuating residents exited the building at 0321. Naomi called Lee Chapman when he was on the phone with the Metropolitan Police from Kuala Lumpur trying to explain his wife's predicament. The transcript records Lee suddenly speaking to Naomi and realising she was out, but the others were not. During the course of the call, Lee told the police that 10 people tried to get out behind them and she can't see them. PC Jacobs of the Metropolitan Police Service was wearing body-worn camera on the night. It recorded at 032114, Naomi Lee calling out to firefighters in command unit eight that there was a woman with three children in flat 193. A police message regarding a female with three children was then recorded at 032132. PC Jacobs passed the information on at 0323. 26. So Naomi and Lydia had been saved, but that one crew had been diverted, and that was a tragic lost opportunity for what by that time would have been both the Shukare family and the Kadir family in that flat. The final calls from flat 193 began at a point in time when Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe must have exited. At 03.08.13, a caller believed to be Hesham Kadir was put through to BTA Exchange where he called for a helicopter. When he was passed through to CRO Gotts, he asked, can we escape from the helicopter, which he said he could see. She did not tell him that he could, that could not happen. She told him they were sending big ladders. During the call, someone believed to be Noura Jamal, or possibly Basim Shukair, could be heard to scream, please, please, we're burning. The fire is getting inside. CRR Gotts told the caller again that they were sending ladders. The caller said, if you send helicopter, we can escape. The operator replied, all right, well, I'll pass that over to let them know where you are. At 0314, Nadia Shuker was put through to BT Exchange. The call lasted for 1 minute 30 seconds. Nadia's opening, opening sentence is, my daughter's unconscious, she's dying. Given Zainab's young age, it is likely that Nadia was referring to her. Nadia was told that the LFB has advised everybody to get out of the building to which she responded, I can't breathe, we can't, my baby's unconscious. She pleaded repeatedly for a helicopter. The BT operator told her to try to get out as quickly as they could. In response to the advice given, Nadia is heard saying, we need to go on the staircase, guys. We need to go on the staircase. On being transferred to the control room at 03 the call cuts off. But before it does, someone else is in the flat and can be heard to shout, can we go on the staircase? Right, guys, we need to go on the staircase. You need to go on the staircase. Are you listening, everyone? Is everyone listening? Right, we need to wet ourselves and go on the staircase. At 0321, <coughs> Nadia Shukare was called by the Metropolitan Police Operator as a result of the previous call being cut off. The operator had been told the caller's name was Nadia. Upon her answering, he told her, Nadia, you need to escape by all means necessary. She told the operator that there was so much smoke, but he replied, 
you're going to have to escape by all means necessary. In response to which someone says, right, we're going to have to go out, guys. We're going to have to go out, the police said. Panel, the 0314 and 0321 calls taken together cumulatively indicate a further attempt to escape, but it did not succeed. Chairman, as you as the panel will also be aware of, the helicopter at this time was capturing images of the tower and relaying the location of people trapped. However, the heli-tele download link was not working, and so this was not transmitted to the command unit or the control room. The family have identified images from flat 193. As I mentioned earlier, at 3.01, someone is seen waving something at the window. The family believe that this is Bassem or Nadia. At 3.15.30, a lady, possibly Nadia, is seen waving again. At 3.17.36, the message is relayed. We have people trapped on the building west side, southwest corner, on floor 17, 20, 21, on the end flats of the west side on the floor, I have spoken to LFB. At 03.21.18, MPS helicopter confirms woman with three children from 193. At 03.22.45, two people are seen by the window, possibly Bassam and Nadia. At 03.23.32, recordings are heard on MPS relating, MPAS relating to flat 193. At 032402, a final 999 call began with Hashim Qadir using Nadia's phone to speak to CRO Duddy. You will hear more detail about this call in the presentation this afternoon. The call lasted just under 15 minutes. It begins with Hashim Qadir telling the operator that they are trapped in 193. He told the operator that they had tried to get out, but there was too much smoke, that they could not even see one meter, to which the operator made clear, this is your only chance. Hashim again asked whether they could send a helicopter, to which the reply was, quote, there's no other way, you have to try. There appears to be some last effort, including calling the names of the children, but the recaller repeatedly says, we are dying. There are some last personal words heard on the recording, which you will hear about this afternoon. The call ended at approximately 03.39. Helen Gebremeskel, called Nadia Shuker several times during the course of the fire. On the last occasion, while Miss Gebremesco was still in the tower, but just before they went out, in fact, exiting at 03.37.30, she urged Basim Shuker that the family should try to escape. At about 03.30, Mirna Shuker spoke to her friend, Nadia Albuti's daughter, for the last time to say that the flat was really hot and full of smoke and she did not think they could get out. The phase one report at volume four, paragraph 30.85, records that some of those who made 999 calls from within the tower were given the impression that rescue by helicopter might be possible or at least were not told in clear terms that it was not possible. It is apparent from Nadia's 999 calls, as well as calls from others who died in flat 193, that they thought that rescue by helicopter was a possibility. As you have heard in other presentations, so did, for instance, Mariam El Gwari, who asked for a helicopter or chopper to get them out in a call at 022538 to CRO Housen, and was told, there is, there is one there, okay, all right, the fire brigade are on their way now, they're making their way. It can be added that as the phase one recorded, 
Heshim Rahman's friend, uh, Anna Kuvlova, asked if, helicopter, if a helicopter could be used at 2.36.12. Palos Tekel, as you will hear this week, requested a helicopter at 02.42 and 14. The presence of helicopters is of great significance to the members of the Shukare family. Like other occupants of the tower, Nadia and Bassam were left with a false hope that a helicopter rescue was possible. May I say one last thing about the 999 course? We've gone through today a sequence of call transcripts based on preserved tapes of calls that is the largest body of evidence of its kind from the night of the fire and has understandably been the source of great challenge to this family to listen to and to assist the inquiry in identifying callers and understanding accents or speech which might, might, which might not be identified by original transcribers. However painful to listen to, these calls have enabled the inquiry to comprehend a great deal and the accuracy of the evidence is something the family are duly concerned about. To ensure that the evidence is properly understood and preserved, the solicitors for the Shukare family have written to you about the transcripts of the 99 calls made from flat 193. Suffice it for me to say on the family's behalf that they invite the inquiry to pay close attention to the audio recordings presented to the inquiry when making their fact finding and not to rely solely on the existing transcripts. The archaeology investigation established that the six family members died in the southwest corner of the living room of flat 193 in close proximity to one another, also very nearby with the Hashim Kadir family. Based on the positions of the family's loved ones, it appears that the adults had formed a protective shield around the children, and in a very powerful sense, they died together as they lived, caring for one another. Professor Purser initially estimated in section six of his phase one report that the adults would have lost consciousness sometime around 0411 to 0413 and died a few minutes later. He explains that young children such as Zainab would likely have become unconscious earlier, closer to around 0353, and died soon after. That's page 54 of section 6, at paragraph 253 of Professor Purser's report. With the older children, who were aged 11 and 13, the same point could apply, but as he said in his evidence to the inquiry, that point is less certain. The reference is day 296, Page 109, lines 9 to 12. Professor Purser correlates time of death to the spread of the external fire across the south face of the building, which reached the living room area of flat 193 after 0337, and which would have caused a rapid deterioration in conditions, similar to that reported in flat 203 above, which experienced a similar pattern of fire spread. Professor Purser's initial estimated times of unconsciousness and death were based on the, the assumption that the family's uptake of toxic gases was similar to that of Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe, who, as you heard, exited the flat 193, and Abu Fras, who fell from flat 203, the flat above, at 0350. However, in his oral evidence to the inquiry, Professor Purser clarified the point of difference for the Shukare family being that there was an eight minute period of exposure during the escape attempt between 0244 and 0252, which could also explain the evidence that Zainab was already unconscious by the time of the 999 call at 0314. And that is transcript 297, page 57, line 11 to page 58, line 20. The 999 recordings suggest that in desperation, the family tried to escape again between 0314 and 0321. Finally, the Kadir family can be heard to be near to unconsciousness during the final call that ended at 0339. 
This all likely shifts the estimated times of unconsciousness and death of the family back to a slightly earlier period. In any event, Professor Professor's evidence provides the evidential foundation to properly give the medical cause of death for all members of the family as the more specific and informative formulation of inhalation of fumes, rather than the more generic formulation of consistent with the effects of fire, currently found in all of the final post-mortem reports for this family. They were completed without the benefit of Professor Purser's detailed phase two work, or the various other lines of evidence, including the cause. To that we add the archaeological evidence that shows that the two families lost consciousness in close proximity to one another, in positioning at odds with the fire having been inside the living room at the time. Professor Purser concluded that due to the predicted rapid increase in smoke and asphyxiant gases in flat 193, it is likely that the occupants would have become comatose and then died from inhalation of toxic gases before they were exposed to significant heat, a conclusion further reinforced by the additional factors shifting the likely time of death back explored with and accepted by Pref Professor Purser in his oral evidence. And I give the reference transcript 2957, 57, line 11. Members of the panel, can I end by observing something that becomes obvious from the presentation of the known facts? This is a family that did everything they could to seek assistance, to try to escape when advised to do so, and to look after one another in that flat right up until the very end. The memorial at Avondale Park School is for all of these family members who died. Since that terrible night, Hissam, Sorsan, Malak, Jamil, and Nabil have impacted on everyone who has met them. They have contributed to the insight and the rigor of this inquiry, and they have done it in the memory of the three generations of their family who died. It is a privilege for their legal teams to present what we have told you today on their behalf and behalf of the rest of the family members who have participated in the inquiry. It was Syria Oshukare's wish to be buried next to her husband in the family's home visit, village in Lebanon. The six members of the Shukare family are there now buried. Just some parting words from these surviving siblings. Sorsan, the way to respect beautiful people who died is to ensure justice. Hissam, they were not just ordinary people, but also extraordinary people. They were our family, and they should still be here. Malak, they were a lovely, caring family and outgoing people. They will be remembered in my heart forever and never forgotten. And Nabil, beyond lovely, the best family. And again, they will always be in our heart and soul. They will never be forgotten. Panel, together these bereaved people tell you, our loved ones now look down at us to get the justice they deserve in every way. Our loved ones now look down at you, the chair, and the panel members for justice. Grenfell must never, ever happen again so that no one will ever suffer the way we are suffering now. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. <clears throat> there will be another presentation later today, but that will not take place until 2 o'clock. So we shall rise now and resume, please, at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. Yeah.